All right, so we're going to finish up this chapter on aldehydes and ketones today. And do a bit of review and a bit of synthesis practice since it's been a while. That's new. Little thing that says, are you sure you want to stay in this meeting because it's being recorded? I haven't seen that before. Um, so let's go ahead and start by talking about the quiz. Um, so first off, most relevant to our class right now is there's a couple places in some textbooks that will use this phrase catalytic H plus. Um, and so I got a question about is catalytic H plus the same as putting H3O plus above the arrow? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, it's just a uh, another way of writing the same thing. So you can see it as sometimes you'll just see it as H3O plus. Sometimes you'll see it as H plus or catalytic H plus. Sometimes you'll just see it as a specific acid, most commonly H2SO4. Um, partly because H2SO4, the conjugate base of H2SO4 is less likely to act as, um, as a nucleophile and interfere with the reaction. So con um, contrary to Gen Chem, we don't see HCl used as a catalyst very often in OCHEM because the chloride itself will act as a nucleophile and produce byproducts. And hydrogen sulfate is much less likely to act as a nucleophile. So all of these are um, just different ways of saying you have um, hydrogen or have an acid as a catalyst. So you have your first step is probably going to be protonating something, <clears throat> doing a proton transfer to, to a partial negative charge. Um, anytime you see a, an acidic situation, your first thought should be, where can I protonate? So good thing to be paying attention to. Um, somebody asked about a light driven enzyme that could be used to make biofuels. And so this is a this is one I hadn't seen before. It's it seems like this process is or this enzyme works in a way that's very similar to um to photosynthesis that, and uses a cofactor that's similar to photosynthesis. The difference is that photosynthesis um, uses light to reduce the carbon in CO2 to a sugar. And this is really interesting in that it takes, it's a fatty acid decarboxylase, fatty acid photo decarboxylase. So decarboxylation means you're removing a CO2 group. You're removing a um, carboxylic acid group. Um, and so this actually is a way to convert fatty acid chains um, into alkenes or alkanes. And alkenes and alkanes are very useful. Basically, that's what gasoline is, is a collection of different alkanes that are about the same um, molecular weight. So this has a potential to, to be able to produce lots of um, biofuel because you can take um, the oil, you can take corn oil or any sort of fatty, fatty material from a, um, a bio production line. So anything agricultural. Um, and with this enzyme, you could potentially turn it into something that a gasoline engine could run on. Because right now you, you can take um, oils and you can, you can modify a diesel engine to run on vegetable oil or you can take vegetable oil and you can convert it to biodiesel, which will run in a regular diesel engine, but you can't run a gasoline engine on, um, on a biofuel at this point. So this has the potential to change that and allow gasoline engines to still be used. Um, it's still not truly a, it's, this makes it a green and sustainable um, energy model in some respects, because it would become carbon neutral at that point. Right, because you're you're taking a plant product that took CO2 out of the air, and you're taking that plant product and you're turning it back into a fuel that's going to put CO2 back into the air, 
but in theory, it's carbon neutral because you're only putting the same amount of carbon back into the air that you took out of the air to begin with. So that takes technically makes it carbon neutral. Um, it's still going to be producing some amount of CO2 and we'd probably be better off once we remove CO2 from the atmosphere, leaving it out of the atmosphere for right now while we try and get a, a handle on climate change. Um, but it is still something that um, could potentially be of a lot of use in the future. Um, so, and there's, it's unlikely that we will fully get away from um, liquid fuels entirely as a as a society uh, in the near future, partly because there at this point there's still not a better way to move things around the United States other than using trucks and trucks and electric trucks don't have the capacity to travel hundreds of miles um, the same way that electric cars can. So for personal use, electric cars might start taking over, but be pretty unlikely that we fully get rid of uh, liquid fuels entirely. So there's still some potential for this to be useful. And this last one was an interesting question about genomics um, where they, so this, this question doesn't give you the full context. Yeah, yes, yet it's possible that with improved battery life and um, potentially even with improved um, photovoltaics, you could put photovoltaics on the top of a train and have have that train generate enough electricity to keep moving um, as it moves across the, the US and not have to burn diesel to generate its electricity. Um, I bet you didn't know that diesel trains are actually electric. They just burn diesel to generate their electricity because there's still not a more energy dense way to um, produce electricity than burning diesel in a generator yet they might be moving away from that so sean quick question do you think um because i know like after 2035 or something they're saying only electric um do you think so so diesel powered like personal private vehicles aren't going to be that's you're saying they aren't going to be a thing but i, I would I would wager that 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 diesel and gasoline in general are going to be used predominantly for commercial applications, not as much for personal applications. But there's going to be a lot of what all that legislation that says like we need to be done with with fossil fuels. There's so many loopholes and exceptions granted for industry and for military and government use um, that it will be a long time before we're truly fossil fuel free. Right. Um, but we're moving that way and, yeah. you know, and going biofuels is a way to at least make it carbon neutral. So we're not making the problem worse, even if it doesn't make the problem better. Yeah. I was just like, oh, if I buy a new car now, am I going to be screwed over when 2030 comes around, you know, and all the gas stations are gone? Yeah. And, and you know what I, so, um, my wife and I, we have two cars. They're both SUVs that are four wheel drive because we live up here in the snow and they, um, and they both have over 200,000 miles on them. Um, so we're looking at getting a new car and that right now, it, it's really tempting to replace at least one of them with an electric car. Um, because, but at the same time, it, it's really, uh, you know, we still don't have the charging stations installed at the school yet um, mm -hmm. and things like that. So there's still a lot of, of logistical things that prevent the average consumer from getting an electric car, but hopefully yeah. that all gets taken care of quickly. Yeah, hopefully. And hybrids are getting better and better too, more and more reliable. The battery life is getting better and better on them too. So we'll see how that all shakes out. Um, this was an interesting article that I had not heard about yet, but this doesn't surprise me. Um, researchers, genomic, genomicists, geneticists, um, were able to take the the uh, current genome of three related bear species and actually work backwards um, from these three current modern bear species to sequence two extinct bear species. Because, and it basically works by mix and matching. You can say, you can look at what the three genomes are of these modern bear species and say, okay, well, they, they all share this genome is 
completely preserved in all three of these. So therefore we know that the ancient bear species must have had this exact gene as well, because it'd be very, very unlikely for, it, for a bear species, an ancient bear species to diverge into two modern bear species and keep and have the exact same gene in both of the modern bear species without the original bear species starting with it. Um, so they basically are able to work backwards and use statistics um, to, to work out, okay, well, if these ancient versions of the bears must have had these, these, same, um, these same genes present in order for, for the, the modern bear species to exist the way that they do. So this would only work for fairly closely related species and not probably for look going back something as far as dinosaurs. Um, but in theory, if you're only, if your ancient ancestor is only a few steps removed, a few evolutionary steps removed, you can take existing modern species and use that to determine what the sequence, the genome was um, for that extinct species. Um, and it really modern genetics is hugely statistics and computer science based because it's all about about finding what what's the probability that this that this change happened that this mutation happened and what's what did it probably that ch change from um in the past and so it's it's very probability driven which is is kind of cool um but you also have to be pretty good at computers to be good at genetics these days because there's so much data out there you have to be able to analyze it well um which also brings me to a good um i saw a, an application the other day of um there was a huge amount of duplicated work in the genetics fields um because the program that exported the genetics data was not compatible with excel everybody including top of the line top of their field geneticist uses Excel to analyze their data. And this program exported the data in a way they had to go through and manually change the formatting um, of something like a million lines of code, a million lines of genetic code, because just because they, the programs weren't playing nice. And you guys have a taste of what it's like when programs don't play nice with each other after having fought with games for the last two weeks um, and MacMole. Um, so it, that does not go away just because you're out of undergrad. Fighting with formatting issues continues to be a problem if you go into research, unfortunately. Um, and then we'll actually talk about that question that a few of you guys saw that, I, that didn't get uh, removed entirely. We'll talk about that question um, in lab today because we'll start, we'll work on um another potential energy surface and talk about some of the the logic behind it i don't think i'll have you run the calculations that's the extra credit one from last week um so we, um you, unless you want the extra credit you don't have to run those calculations but we'll talk a little bit about the logic of it and how that calculation would work um and then today's lab will mostly be practice doing synthesis problems um, because we need some more practice reviewing some of our old reactions. Uh, in general, you guys did pretty well on the on the quiz um, in terms of the reactions. Um, this bicyclic structure opening up to form the car the aldehyde um, and two OH groups was kind of a tricky one to keep track of all the hydrogens, but you guys did well on it. Um, and the the main thing that people missed was this was um, the Wittig reaction at the beginning, um, and it was just that either missed the phenyl group that was attached to one side, or you got the wrong isomer. A benzene ring attached here is going to be electron withdrawing because it's a bunch of pi bonds conjugated, right? In an electron withdrawing group means you should make the E stereoisomer. So let me pull up MacMol so I can, or not MacMol, uh, MolView.
Um, so your product here would wind up looking like, so we had three carbons, we're replacing the OH with a, so there was a T-butyl group, we're replacing the OH or the carbonyl with a ketone. No, we're replacing the carbonyl with an alkene. Um, and the fact that we have this benzene or this benzene ring attached here, remember pH is shorthand for a, a phenyl group or a benzene ring. Um, and it's elect, it's the substituent that's on the phosphorus carbon. If it's electron withdrawing, that gives us the E stereoisomer. So you should have made, so this should have been your product. If you drew the Z conformer, you know, minus a quarter point, minus half point. I don't remember what I did exactly. Um, but the main thing, what it's, we're looking at whatever is attached here is going to determine what stereoisomer we make. Um, the, beyond that, the other common mistake that was made was actually, I believe, was on this reaction down here, um, where you guys didn't necessarily go that second step. Remember, it says minus H2O which means your final product is supposed to be missing the oxygen. You fully remove the carbonyl oxygen and replace it with a carbon nitrogen double bond. So your final product would look like something like this. All right, if you just did the first step, then you wound up with the intermediate that looks like this, where you've taken the carbonyl and converted it to an OH. Um, it doesn't, especially if it says minus H2O, you're supposed to take it to the next step and that um, oxygen is going to be turned into water as a good leaving group and actually leave. So if it says minus H2O, you need to go all the way through, not stopping halfway. Right, and that minus H2O is the very clear clue that's telling you you're going to be totally replacing the oxygen. The oxygen is going to be gone from these reactions. Um, the rest of these, I think you all did fairly well. The last one, again, some of you didn't take that second step um, you added the phenyl group where the carbonyl is. So started here, um, your intermediate is then going to look like, let's see, it's a five-sided ring, two oxygens. Um, your intermediate will look like single bond here, had a benzene ring attached. So you made an OH group. The second step here is if you add acid to this situation, this acetal group, this acetal protecting group gets chopped off and you turn it back to a carbonyl. So your final product here look like this. So if you forgot to go to that second step, remember these acetals, this is really the same reaction that we saw up above. You had an acetal up above, but then um, when you added acid to it, turned the, carb the acetal carbon back into a carbonyl, and then you had two OHs. Do the same thing here. We would chop that off, and then we wind up with ethylene glycol as our byproduct. So our other product would be the with two OHs on it, the diol. All right, but um, in general, you guys were getting the hang of we're attacking, we're attacking carbonyl carbon with all of these reactions, um, and just a matter of 
how it rearranges after that initial attack that separates the one reaction from another in this chapter. Any other questions um, about the quiz at this point? Um, like I said, I can usually tell based on the questions that are asked if we're going at the right speed or even we're even maybe a little bit slow, but I don't mind taking our time since we're adding a lot of um, reactions in this chapter. And our last one is, is the most complicated new mechanism for this chapter, and it's called the um, Bayer Villager oxidation. Uh, and interestingly enough, Bayer, that's the same Bayer as Bayer aspirin. It's not spelled the same because it's been anglicized, but Bayer that first synthesized aspirin um, was, a, was a German um, organic chemist. Um, so back in the days when they didn't have things like the FDA to regulate drugs, um, you know, if you were a chemist and you made some new product, you tasted a little bit of it, or you gave it to, to an animal to see what happened. Um, and if the animal didn't dry, then you tasted some of it. And so they wound up with a lot of, of early drug design was not particularly safe in the way that it was done, but you wound up with a lot of, of early um, chemists wind up got being known for drug discovery as well. Um, so this particular reaction, and actually I'm now I'm thinking that this Bayer might be the father of the Bayer that synthesized aspirin. So I'd have to, I'll double check that on our break, um, but they're related for sure. Um, this reaction is basically, it's a very careful oxidation reaction that allows you to take a, an aldehyde or a ketone and add an oxygen to it in a very predictable way. So if we just, if we started from an aldehyde and we added a strong oxidizing agent, we could convert it to a carboxylic acid and that was no problem. We used dichromate or chromic acid. Um, if you use a um, peroxy acid, a CO3 H group, we actually wind up with a different process happening where we are able to basically add an oxygen right next to the carbonyl carbon. And then we, it goes through a rearrangement step. We wind up with this first intermediate Um, this first intermediate is basically just you wind up with the peroxy acid oxygen acts as a nucleophile and attaches there and you wind up making a, a tetrahedral intermediate similar to what we've seen before. Um, and then it goes through a, a little proton transfer within the same molecule. You ba basically can move the hydrogen over to the carbonyl from the peroxy acid um, because you make a five-sided it's a five-sided ring to do that. So basically this oxygen lone pair can get close enough to the hydrogen to do that. You can't do that with a regular carboxylic acid because you only have four, um, you have um, only four atoms instead of five. And so the sterics are such that you can't get that lone pair close enough to the hydrogen to do this. Um, but if it's a peroxy acid and you have that one extra oxygen in there, all of a sudden that changes things and we can do this internal proton transfer. Um, and then the last step is a tricky one because essentially you wind up with one of the things that attached to what was your carbonyl group winds up moving over and attaching to the oxygen. And then you wind up with the other um, two oxygens leaving. So you take your peroxy acid and you turn it to a regular carboxylic acid and you wind up with one of your R groups migrating over to do a rearrangement. And so we turned in a ketone into an ester. So that's a very, very specific way of oxidizing this, not completely oxidizing to the point of burning it. And we can't use dichromate or chromic acid to oxidize ketones because we said that we could only do that if it was a primary carbonyl, if it was an aldehyde um, or a, a primary alcohol, we could use chromic acid or dichromate 
to, to um, fully oxidize a carbon. But this is a way to add another oxygen to the system in a very predictable way, even if it's a secondary carbonyl, if it's a, a ketone. Right? And so the trickiest thing about this is how do we determine which R group moves? And so they call that migratory aptitude, which is, a, is exactly what it sounds like, migratory you know, migration, aptitude, how likely is it or how good is it at migrating? Um, and it doesn't just go according to sterics. It doesn't just go according to what's the smallest. When we first did carbocation rearrangements, we said, okay, well, hydrogens are the smallest, so they're the most likely to rearrange. Then we said, or, and then you can do a methyl, and if it's bigger than a methyl, it doesn't rearrange at all. That's not the case for this mechanism. For this mechanism, hydrogens are the most likely to migrate because they're the smallest and most stable with a positive charge. So this actually goes in order of stability of, of the positive charge of the um, migrating group. So if a hydrogen is pulled off of the carbonyl as a positive charge, it's really stable. That's why proton transfers are so common. The next most stable is a tertiary carbon. And then the, the, after that, secondary and phenol, phenolic um, or phenyl groups are the next most likely to transfer, then primary, then methyl. So hydrogen's the most likely to travel. And then you kind of go in according to what the biggest group is, because it's, that's what's going to be the most stable leaving group. Um, and so this is basically how we pick which of these R groups keeps moving as soon as they start trying to draw. Which of these R groups is gonna move over to the oxygen It follows this order. So if one of these R groups is a hydrogen, the hydrogen moves over. If neither of them is a hydrogen, but one is tertiary, the tertiary carbon moves over. And then if neither of them is tertiary, you look to see if one of them is secondary. And if so, the secondary carbon moves over. Right, so this is, is basically a, a flow chart of um, look to see which of these you have closest to the left with the most migratory aptitude. And that's the carbon that's going to actually move over. And so let's practice that. I'll put the migratory aptitude order up there for you. I'll give you guys a few minutes to try and draw your product for these.
All right. So for this first one, so and it, it can be helpful to break down what the two R groups are explicitly when you're trying to write this. So you're not trying to figure this out from the intermediate. Um, in this case, if you're, the R group is what's attached directly to the carbonyl. So our choices are either an ethyl group or a cyclohexyl group. The cyclohexyl carbon is secondary. The ethyl carbon is primary. So the cyclohexyl group, despite the fact that it's a larger group overall, the fact that it's a secondary carbon makes it more stable with a positive charge. And therefore, it's the group that's going to move on, um, and attach to the new oxygen. So we wind up making this product over here, where we have a cyclohexyl ester. All right, so on the second one, so I'll rewrite that product up here so you have. Right, so we have a choice. On the second one, we've got our, our first R group is this ethylpropyl, if we were naming that, that as a branch, that would be one ethylpropyl group, or hydrogen. Hydrogens are most likely migrating group because it's most stable with a positive charge. And frankly, it's also small. And that means easy, it moves quickly as well. So for two reasons, hydrogen makes sense to have the most migratory aptitude. So if we're going to insert an oxygen in between the carbonyl carbon and the hydrogen, our result is going to be a carboxylic acid. Just like if we, if we oxidize an aldehyde using any other method, we, got, we would get the same thing. So leave everything else where it is. There's our product. And last but not least, we get one that's not a ring opening or a ring forming reaction. It's a ring modifying reaction, I guess. So we still want to be paying attention to the number of carbons. But we're if we're going to be adding an oxygen next to our carbonyl, we're going to be wind, we're going to wind up adding one atom to this ring. So we're going to go from a five-sided ring to a six-sided ring. It's just a matter of do we add the oxygen to the left of the carbonyl or to the right of the carbonyl? And so we've got that'd be R2. This carbon would be R1. R2 is more carbons attached to it. So R2 is going to be the carbon that moves. So we're going to wind up making a ring structure that looks like that. And then you just have to remember to add the branches in the right spots. The ones on the left-hand side of the ring didn't change. So you still have a methyl that's on the alpha carbon. And then on the right-hand side of the ring, <clears throat> we added an oxygen, and then we had the two methyls are attached to the carbon, attached to the oxygen. All right, so this, again, this is a, a, a reaction that winds up being fairly useful in terms of taking a, an existing ketone and adding and turning it into an ester, um, esters have very different properties than ketones. Um, 
And so this winds up being something that is useful in terms of pharmaceutical chemistry or in chem chemical synthesis, because there's a lot of ketones out there that can be converted into an ester this way, and that changes their properties significantly, um, both in the body and chemically. Esters are very different. We've now taken a class two carbonyl and turned it to a class one carbonyl, which means we have a whole different range of reactions that we can do now as well, that we'll get into in the next chapter. And while we're at it, might be a good time to look at um, our schedule. So we have, we're in week five right now, right? This is beginning of week five. And uh, if we want to double check and make sure we actually have our midterm coming up next Thursday. So this coming Thursday, I will get you a study guide or a practice midterm um, so that you guys can start getting ready on it. And we're a little bit behind. We're still finishing up um, chapter 19 right now. I think we, we will still we will still be able to get um, chapter 20 in between um, this coming Thursday and next Tuesday, because it's basically one reaction done a whole bunch of different ways. Um, where, so it's just gonna be adding new functional groups and it's going to be nucleophilic substitution reactions as opposed to nucleophilic addition, like we've been seeing. So I think I don't think we'll get chapter 21 in before the exam. Oh, that's a, yeah. The, in the exam review will be next Thursday during our um, lecture time, and the midterm exam will be like we've done in the past. Pick two hours sometime over the weekend. Do your test um, before sometime before before um, Sunday or Monday at midnight. Um, and if you need additional time, um, or if that time doesn't work, if you need the, the test early or something like that, just let me know and we can work with you on um, on timing for that. But it's going to be sort of at your own, not at your own pace because it will be timed, um, but sort of pick your own two hours sometime on between Thursday and, and Monday to take that test. All right, so your exam review will be next Thursday in lecture. All right, so with that in mind, um, we are going to do a bit of review today. And actually, you know what? Let's take let's take twenty minutes. Include that will be including a ten minute break, um, and try and review these practice problems. If you treat acetone, a ketone, with these, what are we? There's 12 different reactants. Most of them are going to go through the same mechanisms where it's going to be nucleophilic addition and then some sort of rearrangement. Um, and try and come up with a product for these 12 reactions. And we'll start going through them at nine o'clock. So take your break and start working on these or vice versa. Um, and we'll come back at nine and start working on them.
All right, so let's start bringing it back and working on some of these. So if we have a primary amine or just ammonia, we're going to wind up with that um, imine group where we have a carbon nitrogen double bond. So we're basically just replacing the oxygen in acetone with um, with a double bonded nitrogen. So we wind up with something that looks like So remember acetone is just propanone. So we wind up with something like this. Or a. And I'm just going to go the left side first than the right side so that I can keep my mole view window open that way. I don't know if I could see what you're doing there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Forgot to hit resume share. <laughs> so we wind up here with that I mine structure, carbon nitrogen double bond. And instead of having another R group attached, if it's ammonia that we're using, instead of a primary amine, we just wind up with a hydrogen left over still attached. Um, if we do a dehydration reaction with an alcohol, we turn that alcohol into an acetal attached where the carbonyl was. So for C, we'd wind up with two oxygens attached and each oxygen has two carbons attached. So we have two ethyl ethers attached where the carbonyl oxygen was attached. All right, and again, remember that that minus H2O is your key that you're taking this all the way to the end of um, a particular pathway where it's going to go through that second step where you eliminate the OH group. The first step for all of these is going to be turn that carbonyl into an OH group. If it says minus H2O, that means you're going to then remove that OH group and do some sort of rearranging. And so E, it's the same, same basic reaction as making the imine except that our R group that's attached is another nitrogen. It's the only difference if you're using that um, diamine structure. For G, if we expose this to a hydride source, we're going to go through an addition reaction where we turn the carbonyl into an alcohol and we attach an extra hydrogen to the carbonyl carbon. And that methanol is just acting as a proton source to protonate your oxygen anion at the end. Right. So initially, when you first wind up with the hydride attaching, We have something that looks like this with a negative charge on the oxygen. And so the methanol is just acting as that proton source to turn that into an alcohol. And again, that's, that's one that we've seen before, right? We saw that one all the way back in the alcohol chapter back last quarter. If we have cyanide acting as our nucleophile, we're going to replace that carbon. We're not, it's not uh, fully dehydrating it. You're not losing the oxygen entirely. We're going to be turning the oxygen from a carbonyl into an alcohol. And then we wind up with that nitrile group attached. Right, which can then go through other reactions. You can either fully reduce this and turn that into a primary amine, 
um, or you can oxidize it and turn it into a carboxylic acid and remove the nitrogen entirely. Um, but just the way it's written, it just exposing it to hydrocyanic acid or cyanide is just going to have the cyanide act as your nucleophile and do your nucleophilic addition reaction. Um, here's another, another phosphorus. We've got the triphenyl phosphorus double bound to a propyl group. So this is going to be that Wittig reaction. And it might be helpful in this case to draw out what your Wittig reagent looks like. So you can see what, whether you're going to get the E or the Z. So our two reactants in this case, we're going to start with our acetone. Then it's going to be reacting with, ah, um, the triphenyl phosphorus. And remember, those phenyl groups are not as important. They're just there. We're really looking at what's double bound to the phosphorus. So in this case, that's a propyl group. We have three carbons in a row, the first of which is double bound to the phosphorus. So we're going to take this carbon and attach it where the oxygen is and keep the double bond. It's just a matter, and in this case, does it matter? Do we get uh, two different stereoisomers, an E versus a Z? No, you got two of the same substituents on one side of the double bond. Yeah, on the on the uh, carbon that's attached to the phosphorus, there's a hydrogen and an ethyl group that are different from each other, but acetone is symmetrical with two methyls attached to it, so it won't wind up mattering. So our final product here is going to be our acetone. Ah, we've got a double bond and then two more carbons attached. So, and you can see looking at the, um, the triphenyl phosphorus, why we use pH as our shorthand here, because this is a lot of drawing for something that we don't really even care about those benzene rings. They're not part of the reaction at all. Um, so using a shorthand, either pH or use the condensed structure for benzene for a phenyl group, which is C6H5. C6H6 is benzene. So C6H5 is a benzene attached to something else. Um, those are really commonly used as shorthand for phenyl groups, um, especially when you don't want to have to draw out the entire structure. All right, questions so far on those on that first half. I mean, I think I've harped on. Go ahead, Cody. I'm just going to re remind myself it's the secondary nitrogens is what gives you the enamine. Correct. Okay. Yeah, if you have two carbons attached to your nitrogen, then you don't have a you only have one good leaving group on that nitrogen. So you can't make a carbon nitrogen double bond that's stable. So it'll make an intermediate that looks like that for a second, and then it goes through an elimination reaction or kind of a rearrangement, really. So that would be like for D. We'll look at it for D here in a second. So for B, if it's not ammonia, if it's methylamine, we once again, we're just going to take our acetone, we're replacing the um, carbon oxygen double bond with a carbon nitrogen double bond, and we get a methyl group still attached to it. If it's two carbons attached to the nitrogen to begin with, if it's a secondary amine, we wind up with this as our intermediate with a positive charge on that nitrogen. And we know that having a positive charge on that nitrogen is possible. Um, you can get a nitrogen with four bonds, but it's not all that stable. Nitrogen is more stable when it's got its lone pair. Um, so it goes through another elimination reaction. So one of the 
hydrogens next door. I'll draw all the hydrogens for the sake of showing the complete structure. In this case, both of the methyl groups attached to the carbonyl were identical, so it doesn't matter which one, but one of these hydrogens is going to be removed by either some remaining base still around or from the oxygen that was kicked off the molecule. Um, and you're going to wind up with that pi bond moving over. To make the enamine. Right. So because neither of these methyls is a good leaving group, we wind up going through the elimination and making the enamine instead. So just a small wrinkle on the same nitrogen-based reaction that we've seen for all these others. And in general, all of the nitrogen-based nucleophiles are going to react to do the exact same thing. The only difference is the secondary amines that have to go through that extra elimination step. But for all of the rest of them, you're replacing, if it's minus H2O, you're replacing the oxygen with a nitrogen double bond. So for F, for instance, we'd be, we're making an oxime is the functional group. But if I'm not testing you on that name of the functional group, it really doesn't matter, right? We're just going to make, we're taking that what was the carbonyl and turning it into a carbon nitrogen double bond. We just have an oxygen, an OH attached um, if we're making the oxime. And I'm, I'm blanking on what the functional group name was, if it was the nitrogen attached. Actually, I bet we can look that up. That is a hydrozone. That's right. Because if you have the two nitrogen attached to the hydrozone, if it's an oxygen attached to a nitro nitrogen, it's an oxime. And you're not going to be tested on naming any of those other than just what is this functional group, maybe. Um, and even that with an open book test seems a little bit redundant to make you rewrite that when you can always just look it up. I don't even have these ones memorized. These are such odd functional groups that don't show up that often um, that it's not all that relevant. They do wind up showing up a lot in chemical engineering because this is one of the ways you can get different polymers and plastics to have different properties is to do things like um switch up your functional group from a um from a ketone to being an oxime is going to give you very different properties in your plastic that you're making um so this is one of the various ways you can get you know say an algae type of plastic versus styrofoam versus um pet versus po um, polythene are going to be adding these different sort of odd functional groups um that are less common, but are going to have slightly different properties. Um, let's save H since that's one we just went over. We'll go over that one in more detail. But J and L were both fairly straightforward. J, we're adding, is a Grignard reaction, right? So we're going to be adding carbons where the to the carbonyl carbon so we took the carbonyl and we turned it into an alcohol and our new r group that we added in this case is an ethyl group so we wind up making um methyl Methyl 2 butanol, 2 methyl 2 butanol would be our product in that case. And lithium aluminum hydride is going to give us the same product as sodium borohydride, right? It's a, just another hydride source. It's a stronger hydride source, but if we're already at class 2 carbonyl, there's really no difference as to how they're going to react. So we're going to be taking that. Um, carbonyl and adding a hydrogen to it and then the following the water is with water is going to give us the protons to protonate that oxygen. 
So we'd wind up with the same reaction. We'd, we would just wind up with the isopropyl alcohol or 2-propanol, be the better name for it. So this last one, the peroxy acid, that's when we just added the Bayer's villager oxidation. So if we start by drawing out our reactants, remember we're trying, the net result of this product was we're going to insert an oxygen in between the carbonyl carbon and one of the other R groups. In this case, our two R groups are identical, right? So we're going to wind up adding an oxygen to one side, and it doesn't matter which side you draw it to, you wind up making methyl ethyl ester or methyl ethanoate. But we'll learn how to name those um, next chapter. All right. So again, the trickiest thing about those peroxy acids is if they're two different R groups, you have to look at that migratory aptitude to determine which R group moves over to the oxygen. And it follows in order of what is the more stable cation. So a hydrogen would move first because that's the most stable cation, then tertiary, then secondary or phenolic or um, phenyl, then primary, then methyl. All right, so it follows our rules for carbocation stability. All right, any questions on this half? All right. Then let's do a little review of synthesis. So today's lab is going to be um, a bunch of synthesis problems. And, um, and I'm not requiring that you solve all of these, um, but you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, synthesis problems. And your assignment is going to be so to solve five of the eight. So your choice, pick which ones you wanna do, but you gotta do five of those eight. Right, so we're, the rest of today's lecture is just going to be a little bit of review on how to think about synthesis since it's been a bit, um, and it's a lot of material. There's some more practice problems here. Um, and we'll come back to these if, if we have time. Um, but for now, let's talk about synthesis. Actually, you know what? If you want more practice with the simpler reactions, we'll go over these in lab later today. So you have a chance to work on some of these yourself, some of the simpler ones. Um, but for now, we'll focus on synthesis. Um, and the key to staying organized and sort of coming up with a plan for synthesis is that we really only have two types of reactions when it comes to synthesis in terms of having sort of a flow chart, a mental flow chart of what types of tools you have in your toolbox, um, you really have these two major categories. You've got reactions that change the carbon skeleton that are either going to do add or remove carbons from what you started with. And then you have reactions that change a functional group. Occasionally, and there's basically within that change the identity of a function, there's, there's essentially only one reaction that will change an alkane into something else. So if you're trying to add a functional group to a molecule that doesn't have a functional group, you almost always are going to do one of those free radical brominations. And then you've got sort of a, a handle that you can grab the molecule with and that you can convert that bromine into whatever other functional group you want. Um, so reactions that change the carbon skeleton, there were a couple versions that would add a carbon. 
Um, so if you had an, a triple bond, you could deprotonate that triple bond um, and turn it into an acetylide, and then it's a good nucleophile. Right, so that first one should look familiar, even if it's been a, been a bit um, since we covered alkynes. Um, if you have a functional group that's oxygen-based, especially if it's a carbonyl, um, then your Grignard reaction is a pretty convenient way to add a single carbon, especially if you want it to stay in the reduced state. If you want something that you're, you can then convert to something else, you can do the cyanohydrin formation to add a single carbon and nitrogen. Um, and then you've got the Wittig reaction. If you want to wind up with a double bond, then it might be convenient to do this Wittig reaction where you can add um, one carbon or multiple carbons to a carbonyl and replace the oxygen. So if you're starting from the Wittig reaction and the acetylide substitution are really not all that different as far as the type of products you wind up with, except for the acetylide, one, you have to start with a, a triple bond on one of your carbon compounds and you need a chloride or a bromide on the other. You need a, a halogen on the other. There it goes. Um, if you have if you have an oxygen instead of a halogen already on your molecule, it might be more convenient to go with the Wittig reaction instead. And I don't know what I did. I changed my. I accidentally changed my view on my tablet. It's messing with me. Um, so those are the only reactions we know at this point that can add a carbon. So depending on where you start, you might pick any one of those potentially to add a carbon to, to um, for a synthesis problem. If we want to remove carbons, we've got a few options as well. We've got ozonolysis, and now we have this bare villager oxidation that allows us to break a carbon-carbon bond. And we'll see next chapter that this ester that we wind up with as a product in the bare's villager oxidation allows us to then remove those extra carbons and convert that ester into a carboxylic acid pretty easily. Um, but for now, we'll just put it in this category just because it allows us to break carbon-carbon bonds. We're breaking a carbon-carbon bond and replacing it with oxygen, right? So that still looks like there's a lot, and I'm not sure why it numbered one, one, two, three um, over there on the left-hand side. But um, beside the point, we had a total of seven reactions that either add or carbons or remove carbons, which yeah, that's still a lot of choices, but when we break it down as to the function, how we're going to use these, um, usually one of them winds up being a more obvious choice than the other. Especially, you know, if you want to add an alkyl group, if you want the carbons you're adding to be fully reduced, full of carbons and hydrogens, that Grignard reaction is going to be one of your go-tos. Um, if you're trying to add something with pi bonds, the acetylide and the Wittig reaction wind up being really obvious choices. If we want to add a single carbon that then gets, and we want it to be oxidized, then the cyanohydrin formation winds up being a good choice. And like I said, usually looking at where you are and where you're trying to go, it'll kind of be clear one of these is a better option and is going to result in fewer steps to get where you're trying to go. That's fewer steps is almost always what you want for synthesis. Um, and just a reminder of the difference between ozonolysis reactions. Ozonolysis of an alkene gives you class two carbonyls. 
Um, and this page shows that you can actually make formaldehyde. Really, if you did ozonolysis and you chopped off a single carbon at the end, that would wind up turning to CO2, as we've seen in our textbook before. Textbooks sometimes are just not all that consistent about showing that since the this follows our general rule and it's not an exception. Um, and almost never do we actually care about the little piece we're chopping off. We want to know about what the big piece is that's left over usually. Um, and then if it's ozonolysis, oh no, there was ozonolysis of the alkyne that turned it into CO2. If you chopped the one carbon off of a terminal alkyne, it turned into CO2. That's what it was. Um, and but if it's ozonolysis of the alkyne, you get the carboxylic acid, which then you could reduce that to an aldehyde or an alcohol. Um, to then turn it into what you want. So this, these ozonolysis reactions are really convenient ways because they leave you with a good functional group. We can then turn into something else pretty easily. All right. Here is one of the summary slides about functional group conversion. Um, and it's very confusing. There's a lot of detail on here because we have a lot of reactions that we know now. We've added a lot of things together. This is specifically looking at um, carbonyls, class two carbonyls being converted. We added a whole bunch on here. Um, and then there were a couple of options um, to go from a from an uh, alkyne to a carbonyl and carbonyls can be converted into alcohols by reducing and alcohols can be converted into carbonyls by oxidizing. We had our, so this was a hydration reaction. Well, Um, and we can control which carbon got the carbonyl by going with the Markovnikov versus the anti-Markovnikov reaction. So that might be one that you need to, to go back and review. How do I get the carbonyl to go on to the more substituted carbon versus the less substituted carbon? Remember, that was Markovnikov's rule. And we had really a, one good option for either way. The mercury catalyzed hydration gave us the Markovnikov product where we put the oxygen on the more substituted carbon and the hydroboration gave us the um, anti-Markovnikov product. So if your reaction, if your reactant involved mercury, that was going to give you the Markovnikov product. If your reactant involved BH3, that gave you the anti-Markovnikov. Um, the alkene being converted to an OH group was also a hydration reaction, right? And had the same general principles, Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov. And it was the mercury-based versus the um, hydroboration controlled that. Um, or we could take that, we had Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov Bromination, or we could take an alkene and add an HBr to it. And if you just added HBr, you got the Markovnikov addition where you put the bromine on the more substituted carbon. Um, and I believe it's if you added HBr with peroxide present, if I'm remembering correctly, that gave you the anti Markovnikov because it went through that um, uh, free radical mechanism instead. And then speaking of free radicals, our last choice, we want to turn an alkane into something with a good leaving group. We did that free radical bromination, right? So we had 
we have a lot of ways to convert back and forth between all these various functional groups. Um, and this new ch newest chapter gave us a lot of tools. That's this is the reaction summary. Uh, the big the big figure on the left is the reaction summary just for this chapter. Um, so there was a lot of other tools as well. And as you're trying to solve some of these, it can be helpful to go to the chapters for the functional group that you're trying to react. Once you make an alcohol, for instance, you might want to go look at the alcohol chapter again to remind yourself, okay, what do I have in my toolbox to convert an alcohol into something else? And that might be how it reminds you, oh, I can convert it to an OTS, which then I can do a substitution to put a bromine there or can go through an elimination reaction to make an alkene. Um, because we do have a lot of options at this point. Um, and let me double check that these are not the reactions in your synthesis practice. And then we'll do a few of these. Yeah, these are different. Um, we can do a couple of practice reactions. Um, for instance, A is a really weird looking one. Um, but if we can recognize, if we can kind of work backwards, to say that, okay, well, that product is an acetal. And I really only know, we really only have one good way to get to an acetal. And that was to start with alcohols and a carbonyl, right? So if you work that backwards and say, okay, well, the carbon that the oxygens are attached to probably started as a carbonyl. Let me zoom in so, uh, so I have a little bit of room to write here. Well, if that carbon was a carbonyl carbon, if we start counting the other carbons, it was there's three carbons and then an oxygen to the left. We look at these. Then there's three carbons then an O8 to the right. So we're probably looking at, so one, two, three, then an OH. One, two, three, then an OH. And the fact that we're, both of these are um, going to attack the same carbon and we're making this bicyclic structure. Let's see, is that going to be oxygen, carbon, 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 carbon? Yeah. So this is the molecule that we must be starting from to get to this weird bicyclic acetal structure. And we must be breaking this, so we must be breaking this molecule apart somehow, because if we count the number of carbons, we actually have the same number of carbons as before, right? We had seven carbons in a ring. We still have seven carbons, but we don't want them in a ring. And we want to be able to convert some of those carbons into alcohols or to, um, have alcohols on those bottom two carbons. So we can kind of see that how the general structure is going to have to change here. So what's our way that we could cut this ring apart? Your ozone, ozonolysis. Exactly, if we do ozonolysis, we can turn that alkene into two carbonyls, right? The two aldehydes in this case. And then those two aldehydes, we could convert into OH groups. However, we have to be careful about that because we don't want to convert all of our 
carbonyls into OH groups. So we might start by converting this into a protecting um, and doing a protective group on that first carbonyl before we do the ozonolysis. So we could start by, let me go to a white screen here so I can, I have plenty of room to work. So if we start from our heptagon, so see if I can draw a seven-sided ring structure. One, two, three, four. Uh, that looks like seven carbons to me, right? Yeah, that's not half bad. So before we do our ozonolysis, if we expose this to ethylene glycol, um, so the condensed structure, which looks like this, that was one of our common protecting groups. If we don't want a carbonyl to react, one of the ways we can do that is by protecting it, by converting it into an acetal. a little sloppy. I think you see where I'm going with that, right? And then we can do the ozonolysis, which is just going to break that double bond and put two carbonyls in its place. And then those can be reduced to turn them into alcohols. So now we'd wind up with, we still have one, two, three. So trying to keep it drawn the same way so that we can see the relationship between these two structures. Now, if we reduce that, with any reducing agent, but sodium borohydride would be a pretty good idea, or lithium aluminum hydride. That's going to take the two carbonyls and turn them into primary alcohols, but it's not going to do anything to the acetal. So then we wind up with Going to wind up with this. Which now we can remove that protecting group by just exposing it to acid. And we'll put that carbonyl back in the middle of this chain. And now we can see, okay, that last reaction is just going to be the dehydration reaction. We're going to make another acetal. Once we get to this product, we can, we can do the expose it to acid minus H2O, which I've now run myself out of space. I'm going to remove, I'm going to erase the first one.
and we're going to wind up with both of these oxygens attaching to that carbonyl and our carbonyl leaving. And that's going to give us our final product that looks like this. And the way that just to write that last reaction is if we want to, to show that we're making that acetal, we just show that it's being exposed to the alcohol and we write that minus H2O. So in the case of both of the alcohols being on our original molecule, we don't even have to write the alcohol we want to put on there because it's part of the same molecule. We could just write acid minus H2O for our reactants on that one. All right, so you don't always need to go to do that retro synthesis all the way back. You don't need to work everything backwards for every step. Sometimes it just takes, if you work it backward one step, that's enough to show you where you need to go. And then you can start to see some of the pieces falling into place. Um, and it really is process of elimination. If you only have one good reaction to make your final product, then that tells you what the step, your second to last step is. And then if you only have one good product reaction to make that, that tells you the step before, right? So it's, it takes practice um, to start to be able to see some of these pieces moving around in your head. And remember, these are mostly going to be coming from this chapter. So you're going to be seeing a lot of the reactions from this chapter showing up here. There's some other reactions in there as well, um, but it's not a bad idea to look at this chapter's reaction reviews first. So for instance, so A, we've got alkenes moving around and we need to be adding, um, and we need to be adding some carbons and we want an alkene bond in between the carbons we started with and the new carbons. So that right there, the fact that our new carbons are connected to our existing carbons with an alkene group tells that that's a really good hint that we might need to use a Wittig reaction. And remember that Wittig reaction was a way to replace a carbonyl with an alkene. So if we could start from, so if we can get to cyclohexanone, then we can get to our final product. So then it's a matter of taking cyclohexene and figuring out how you can get to cyclohexanone, which is going to involve some oxidation steps because you have to add an oxygen somehow or maybe a hydration. Because we're just trying to get to If we can get here, then a Wittig reaction takes us the rest of the way. So how do we get from a, an alkene to a ketone? Well, there's a couple of options. We can make a ketone if we do a hydration of an alkyne but that would mean we need to find a way to convert our alkene to an alkyne and it's on a cyclo group. So that's probably not all that likely. Or we can take our alkene and turn it into an alcohol and then oxidize our alcohol to a ketone. Might be a more efficient way to do it. Right, but, and so that means if we were going to continue go, doing the backwards reaction, to make that cyclohexanone, we would want to make cyclohexanol.
because once we have cyclohexanol, we can do we can do an oxidation step with any reaction any oxidation oxidizer that we want. Um, so, for instance, dichromate Cr two O seven the two minus charge. So now it's just a matter of taking cyclohexene and getting to cyclohexanol. And we have lots of reactions to go from, from an alkene to an alcohol, right? Water and acid would work. Or you could do hydroboration, or you could do the mercury catalyzed, oxymercuration, demercuration. But really, Acid in the presence of water is going to give you that, that very first addition reaction we ever looked at, right? The one that we just did in games in our calculations last week, two weeks ago, was taking ethene in that case and adding water to it. Here, we're taking cyclohexene and adding water to it, but the net reaction's the same. All right. So Again, look for those clues from your final reaction, because a lot of times figuring out the last step is going to start pointing you in the right way and going to make the rest of it a lot easier to see. The shorter the synthesis is, the easier it is to see, right? So even just shortening the synthesis by one step in either direction, if you can figure out what your first step is or you can figure out what your last step is, is going to make things a lot easier to start seeing how the pieces fit together. And I realize that synthesis problems are one of those classic, um, well, it makes plenty of sense when you do it on the board. Um, but if I if I had that same problem, I would be stuck immediately. Um, but there's there's no substitute for seeing some worked examples and then trying to to do it on your own. Even if you do get a little stuck, some of those eight synthesis problems you have to choose from, you're going to be able to see either the first step or the last step pretty quickly, depending on where you're starting and where you're ending. Um, and the ones where you can't maybe leave those and see if you can find some one of the other ones and we'll go over them. Um, so one last example for now. Uh, is if we want to end by making an acetal a diether attached to the same carbon, we probably needed to, the step before this was probably having a carbonyl attached to that carbon. So if we're trying to make this molecule, again, now it starts, that's a lot, maybe not a lot easier, but that at least points us in the right direction. We need a way to make a ketone. And we start with a dibromide. So one of the ways, the two ways that we make ketones are we either take a secondary alcohol and oxidize it. Okay, so there are three ways. Um, Ozonolysis would be one way, but then we're chopping off carbons and we don't want to do that because we have all the carbons where we want them on this one. We could take a secondary alcohol and oxidize, it would give us a ketone. So if we had a way to turn this starting material into the secondary alcohol, we could do the same thing we just did on the previous step, on the previous example. Or we can hydrate and alkyne was another way of doing that, right? So this is one where there are two solutions that I think actually wind up being the same number of steps. We can either do a double elimination here to make 
a terminal alkyne. which then we can hydrate to make the ketone, or we could make it into an alkene, except then we still have one extra bromine still on there. So probably be better to, to do this because if we just did a single elimination to make the alkene, we still wind up with the bromine attached to the alkene on one of them. And then we have to figure out a way to deal with that. Right. So again, your starting material and where you're ending, try and figure out one step either side. And a lot of times that will start making it clear what route you need to go. All right. So we're out of time for lecture. Um, we will, we will meet for um, lab, if you're still struggling with the um, with the games lab, with the finding the potential energy surface for hydration reaction, um, coming to Zoom is usually a lot easier when it comes to me being able to help you troubleshoot any reactions you still need to run, any any jobs you still need to run, or tell you what's going on, why your numbers don't look like mine. It's usually a lot easier for me to tell you in person or on Zoom. Um, so even though that was due last week, I'll still help you finish it up today in lab. Um, and then we will go over some of these other practice problems in lab as well. Um, and I'll, I'll record it lab and post it this week as usual. So if you can't be there, that's fine. Um, if there's any of these reactions in particular that you want to make sure that I go over on and record the solutions to in lab today, um, just let me know before before one, just so I have a, a chance to um, to see that. Um, otherwise, uh, everybody have a good morning, and we'll start on chapter 19 on Thursday. <laughs>